What's going on, everybody? Welcome to yet another brand new installment of Renegades Reviews right here on the Casa D18 Studios channel. I, of course, am the Renegade J.J. Williams, and today I'm going to be talking about, from 1977, the epic miniseries that was Roots, starring LeVar Burton and John Amos in the role of Kunta Kinte, the main character of our story, Louis Gossett Jr., Ben Vereen, Ed Asner, Robert Reed, Sandy Duncan, Carolyn Jones, Lloyd Bridges, Cicely Tyson, Scatman Carruthers, Richard Roundtree, Maya Angelou, O.J. Simpson, Doug McClure, Burl Ives, and very, very young Tracy Gold, and Todd Bridges. Welcome, everybody, to what is sure to be a long episode. So buckle your seatbelts, get your popcorn, get your nachos, get you your tasty beverage, your candy of choice. Go ahead. I will give you a second to get prepared before I jump into this. For those of you that don't know, Roots was a television miniseries, so it wasn't a theatrical film. But I felt that it was the perfect movie, the perfect thing to review, to be the jump-off point for Black History Month. As it essentially is a capsule of one man's family history going all the way back to Omaro and Binta Kinte in Africa in the year 1750. And then it goes all the way up into the 1800s, following this one family. And then at the end of the film, through photo montage, kind of brings us up to date to Alex Haley himself, who was the author of the book, Roots. And that's basically where the whole movie is taken from, was his family's life story, his family history. So again, like I said, I couldn't think of a better way to start Black History Month than to chronicle this history of this family. It is going to be a long episode. Um, Roots, I believe, was originally aired in eight parts on television. And then for DVD and video releases, it was brought down to like six discs, six tapes. But this is going to be... Uh, a hefty episode, so be be prepared, like I said. This is actually the second time I have seen Roots from start to finish. Um, when I was in high school, I took a Black history class my senior year. And over the course of class, over, I want to say, about two weeks, we watched Roots in that class. and. There were certain things that just were engraved into my skull from that point on. And when I rewatched it, I remembered seeing those things. There were things that I didn't remember, obviously, because I was in high school in 1994. So it's been almost 30 years since I was in high school. So it's it's common to forget certain things. But the stuff that I did remember when I re-saw it was just as impactful today as it was when I saw it then. Let me see here. Let me grab my notes real quick. So I want to give you an idea here. I've got two, three, 
five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, thirteen pages of notes that I'm going to be reading off for the synopsis. So I'm going to hold it in my hands, which is something I don't normally do, just so I don't have to keep looking back and forth for this, okay? And it almost will kind of be like I'm reading a story to you guys describing this. But like I said, we begin our film, we start our journey in the year of 1750 in the Gambia in West Africa. Omaro Kinte, Kinte, Omaro Kinte and his wife Binta are giving birth to their son, Kunta Kinte. Omoro is a Mandinka warrior. And when Kunta turns 15 years old, he and other adolescent boys from the tribe are taken off to complete a secret rite of passage. And upon their completion and return to the village, they will be deemed as men. Now, some of the tasks that they have to do include wrestling, warcraft, hunting skills, philosophy, and circumcision. Now, one day during these trials, during these rituals, while trying to catch a bird without hurting it, Kunta discovers a group of European slave hunters and their captives, led by a man named Gardner. One day, not long after the completion of the rituals, you know, Kunta is now returned back to his village. He's a man. He's completed these rites of passage. So one day, not long after Kunta's return, he goes off to gather wood in order to make a drum for his younger brother. Now, one of the things that they taught him during these rituals was not to go out hunting alone. But Kunta, being a stubborn boy, goes out alone anyway. Kunta's captured by Gardner. And then Kunta is sold to a slave trader and placed aboard the Lord Ligonier, which is a slave ship under the command of Captain Thomas Davies for what is supposed to be a three-month journey to colonial America. Now, during the voyage, an insurrection amongst the slaves fails as they try to take over the ship. They are, however, successful in killing Mr. Slater and some of the other crew members. However, several of the Africans also perish and lose their lives. One of them being the Mandinka warrior wrestler who Kunta had to face off in a wrestling match during his ceremonial rites of passage. The ship finally arrives in Annapolis, Maryland in, in 1767. Okay, so just for the math here, we start in 1750 with Kunta's birth. At 15, he had to do the trials, so that would make it 1765. Not long after his return, he was captured, so it would still be 1765. A three-month journey, and they land in Maryland in 1767. So this is a two-year voyage out of a three-month trip. Not to, not to find humor in this situation whatsoever, but it kind of you know, harkens back to the old Gilligan's Island three-hour tour, and they end up getting lost on this island forever. So this three-month trip took two years. And once arrived in Maryland, the captured Africans are sold off at an auction as slaves. John Reynolds buys Kunta at the auction and gives him the name of Toby. Mr. Reynolds then asks Fiddler, one of his older slaves, 
longer tenured, to teach Kunta how to speak English and train him in the ways of servitude so that he'll be a good slave. Now Kunta slowly begins to trust Fiddler and the two eventually form a strong bond. Fiddler becoming almost like a father figure to Kunta. Now Kunta wants to preserve his Mandinka traditions and he was also raised Islamic Muslim beliefs. So he refuses to eat pork and he also attempts numerous times to escape, albeit unsuccessful attempts. After one of Kunta's escape attempts, the overseer gathers the slaves together and orders Kunta to be whipped until he acknowledges that he is no longer Kunta Kinte, he is now Toby. And it takes a lot to break Kunta. Yeah, because like I said, Kunta is a stubborn 15-year-old boy. He's raised with traditions. He believes in these traditions, these things that he stands for that define him. He does not want to surrender that. So it takes a while to crack him, but eventually he does acknowledge that his name is Toby and the whipping stops. Once he acknowledges that and the whipping ends, Fiddler takes Kunta, who is bleeding heavily from his back from all the whip lashings. He takes him back and tries to comfort him. He's telling him basically, you know, there will be another day. It's just not today. We now fast forward to 1776. And Kunta is still haunted by his Mandinka roots and his desire to be free. He attempts to escape again. This time, however, a pair of slave catchers get him to hobble by chopping off almost half of his right foot with a hatchet. Tired of the disrespect from Kunta, John Reynolds decides to sell him to his brother, Dr. William Reynolds, in order to settle a debt with him. He also transfers the servitude of other slaves, including Fiddler, to Dr. William as well. Now, while in the ownership of Dr. Reynolds, Kunta meets Belle, who is the cook for the family. She treats Kunta's mangled foot and is able to help somewhat mend his wounded spirit. By the year 1780, Kunta has officially been broken and he submits to his life of servitude. He realizes that he is never going to get back to Africa and he just needs to make the best out of what he has now. Completely gives up on his dreams to return to Africa and Kunta and Bell end up getting married in a ceremony which includes jumping over a broom. Kunta and Bell end up having a daughter named Kizzy, which means stay put in the Mandinka language. Fiddler and Kunta remain friends until Fiddler dies, an old man, in 1790. It's now the dawn of the 19th century, and Dr. Reynolds has been having an adulterous relationship with his brother John's wife, which ends up producing a daughter named Missy Ann. And John believes that Miss Yen is his child. He doesn't know of the adulterous relationship. Miss Yen and Kizzy end up becoming best friends and playmates despite the social confines of plantation culture. 
Missy Ann even teaches Kizzy how to read and write, which is forbidden in those days. The year is now 1806, and a now teenage Kizzy falls in love with Noah, a spirited slave who attempts to run off with a traveling pass, which was forged by Kizzy. When Dr. Reynolds discovers this, he's hurt. Because unlike most slave owners of the day, Dr. Reynolds has always been compassionate to his slaves, caring and understanding and even giving to them. And he takes the forged pass as a breach of trust. And he sells Noah and Kizzy, much to the dismay of Kunta and Bell. Kizzy ends up getting sold to Tom Moore, who's a man with a sexual appetite for female slaves. On the first night of Kizzy's arrival at Tom's place, Tom violently rapes Kizzy. And as a result of the sexual assault, Kizzy becomes pregnant and gives birth to George nine months later. The year is now 1824, and Sam Bennett is a carriage driver who seeks to impress Kizzy. So he takes her over to Dr. Reynolds' place in order to see her mom and dad. Upon arrival, though, she learns that her mother, Belle, has been sold, and that her father, Kunta Kinte, had passed away two years prior. Kizzy goes to Kunta's gravesite and sees the marker there for him with the name Toby. She scratches it off and writes Kunta Kinte in its place. And she promises him right there at his gravesite that one day his descendants will be free. Kizzy's son, George, begins to learn about cockfighting as he grows older. From Mingo, an older slave. And after a while, under the direction of their master, Tom, George ends up taking over as the chief trainer. George ends up befriending Marsalis, who is a fellow cockfighter, who is a free black man. And Marcellus tells George about the possibilities of potentially buying his freedom from his master. The year is now 1831, and because of his successes as a chicken trainer, George feels that him and his master Tom have become friends. It isn't until George and his family are threatened at gunpoint by Tom during the Nat Turner Rebellion, that George, dis George discovers that Tom was never his friend. Even though none of Tom's slaves took place in the Nat Turner Rebellion, Tom becomes paranoid. And as a result, the slaves band together and plot to buy their freedom from him. And during all of this time, Kizzy reveals to George that Tom is his father. And that could explain why George thought Tom was his friend. Because in reality, that's his dad. Now, over the years, as the years go by, George becomes an expert in cockfighting, earning himself the moniker of Chicken George. Tom and George's biggest rival is a man named Squire James. And Squire James arranges for Sir Eric Russell, a British owner, to visit and participate in the local cockfights. With 20 of his best. Now, Tom makes a huge bet on his best bird, which George has trained. 
but Tom, George, and the chicken all lose. Now, unable to pay the debt of the bet, George is sent to England to train Cox for Russell and to train more trainers because George is so skilled at being a trainer. Now, George is forced to leave behind his mother, Kizzy, as well as his wife, Matilda, or Tildy, and his two sons, Tom and Lewis. George's master, Tom, promises to him that he will set him free once he returns to the States from England. We then see a brief encounter with Kizzy and Missy Ann, where Kizzy asks Missy Ann, you know, do you remember me? And Missy Ann denies ever knowing, and these are lines from the movie here, okay, folks? So don't, don't get upset with me. Missy Ann denies ever knowing, quote, a darkie by the name of Kizzy. Now, hurt at her words from her former best friend, Kizzy spits into Missy Ann's water without her knowing. We fast forward a little bit, and it's now 1861, and Chicken George returns from England just before the Civil War begins. He proudly announces to his family that Tom Moore kept his promise, albeit reluctantly, and that George is now a free man. The first of Kunta Kinte's descendants that is free. He learns that Kizzy, his mom, passed away two months prior, and that his sons now belong to Sam Harvey. George's son, Tom, is now married with two sons of his own. And he is a blacksmith on the plantation. He also discovers that his family has spoken very highly of him in his absence. But with all good news must come some bad news. George learns that according to the state law, if he stays free for 60 days, he will lose his freedom. So George heads north, once again without his family, to seek out the next stage in his life as a cockfighter. And he's trying to keep his freedom, you know, as long as he's not in that state, he can remain free. As the war continues, a hungry and destitute white couple arrive on the plantation, and they're asking for help. Well, Tom and his family take in George and Martha Johnson. Martha gives birth, but the child is born stillborn. As time goes by, Tom begins to get harassed by Evan and Jimmy Brent, a pair of brothers. And they are members of the Confederate Army. Now, about a month before the South surrenders in the war, Jimmy becomes a deserter, shows up at Tom's blacksmith shop, and he asks Tom for a favor. Reluctantly, Tom agrees to help Jimmy by running one errand for him. And upon his return, Tom finds Jimmy attempting to rape his wife, Irene. Tom and Jimmy get into a fight, and it ends up with Tom drowning Jimmy in a quenching tub. Now, later on, Evan shows up, and Evan is now an officer in the Confederate cavalry, and he demands to know what happened to his brother. But nobody says anything. So Evan threatens Tom, saying that he isn't finished with him yet. Some time passes after the Civil War, 
and a group of white men wearing white hoods began to harass Tom, his family, and his community. This is some of the original members of the Ku Klux Klan. And Tom is made the de facto leader in the community. And he comes up with a great idea, a way to identify the men harassing him. As the only blacksmith in town, he, whenever someone comes to get their horses shod, he leaves a unique mark on each horseshoe. That way, when the group attacks again, they can look at the tracks of the horses and know exactly who each horse belongs to. He takes the information that he gathers to the local sheriff. But the sheriff is on Evan's side. So the sheriff gives Evan all the information that was collected. And when the mob leads another raid on Tom and his community, Tom is whipped brutally, very much like young Kunta was. Now, Tom's friend, George Johnson, you know, the, the white couple that they had taken in with the baby that was stillborn, George is now the overseer of the community. And as the overseer of the community, George is forced to be the one to whip Tom. Much to his own horror and dismay. But he does it in order to save his friend's life. Because he can do it. And yes, it'll still hurt but it won't be as ruthless or as relentless as if somebody else did it. And meanwhile, Sam Harvey, the owner of the land, is forced to surrender his property to Arthur Justin, who's a local senator, intent on acquiring as much land as possible. As a part of the deal in surrendering, Sam's slaves will be allowed to stay on the land as sharecroppers, eventually getting to own a piece of the land. Now, over time, the senator voids the deal because there's no written deed filed. Therefore, there's no proof of the agreement ever being made. The senator then begins to impose heavy debts on the black farmers. Now, on the night of Tom's whipping, his father George shows up unexpectedly. The appearance of George lifts the spirits of the community and he and his family begin to plan their future. George tells them that he is now a landowner. So not only is he the first free black man in the family, he's the first landowner as well. George has purchased some land in Tennessee. And after one final encounter with Evan and his gang, George and his family, along with George and Martha Johnson, begin their journey from North Carolina to Tennessee. In the finale of this epic story, George, Tom, and company all arrive on some land in the town of Henning in Lauderdale County, Tennessee. George then begins to pass on the tale and the legacy of his family, starting with stories of Kunta Kinte in Africa, all the way down the family tree to himself there in Tennessee. Ali Alex Haley himself then takes over the author of Roots and shows a montage of photographs connecting Tom's daughter, Cynthia, who was the great, great 
granddaughter of Kunta Kente, all the way to Haley himself. Like I said, it was going to be a long one. Hell of a film, hell of a mini series. If you've never seen Roots, I definitely recommend that you find it and watch it and just set yourself down and and roll with it because it is definitely uh, an experience that must be experienced at least once. Obviously, a film like this is not without its controversies. I know we're going to be talking about some more controversial films probably here in the coming weeks. I do have a few notes that I took that I'd like to point out here. The role of Captain Thomas Davies, who is portrayed by Ed Asner, did not appear in the Haley novel. It was created for television to help white audiences feel better about their role in the slave trade. Because Ed Asner's character doesn't agree with some of the practices that Mr. Slater tries to impose. And Mr. Slater and Gardner, they're in this, this is their life, their business is buying and selling trades. Captain Davies is just the captain of a ship. He's reluctant, he's hesitant, but they use his ship to get the slaves from Africa to America. And by having a character like that, that's hesitant and reluctant, they felt that maybe the white audiences watching the miniseries wouldn't feel so bad because here's this man with a conscience that was involved. Also, there were a lot of white TV actors cast in this um, against type as slave owners and traders. That included Chuck Connors from The Rifleman, Lauren Green from Bonanza, Robert Reed from The Brady Bunch, and Ralph Waite from the Waltons. You know, and if you think about just Robert Reed, we'll just take him because he's the one I'm most familiar with. You know, Mike Brady, the father from the Brady Bunch. The good old wholesome 70s TV dad. A slave owner. Now, granted, he plays... Let me locate his name, Dr. William Reynolds, who's the compassionate one, the one who's hurt when he finds the forged pass. But just to see Robert Reed as a slave owner definitely kind of threw me for a loop. I don't know if I picked up on it too much when I saw it in high school, but being an older man now and more knowledgeable of pinpointing people from certain things as you watch movies definitely was a little bit of a shock to see Mike Brady as a slave owner. Burl Ives, the man who told us the story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and son Holly Jolly Christmas as the senator who basically screws the the people from Sam Harvey's plantation out of being able to own any land in the deal. 
bro lives. You know, it's like seeing some of these actors and actresses in different lights. It's very, very interesting and entertaining. And again, I highly recommend watching this if you haven't seen it before. I'm going to give Roots four and a half out of five stars. This film is amazing. Now, you know what? We're going to go five out of five. We're going to go ahead and give it five out of five stars because when I sit here and I start talking about how amazing it is and how riveting it is, but then to take off half a star just doesn't seem like my words match up. Five stars out of five for Roots. Again, the all-star cast, the performances, the storytelling. It's a very, very good miniseries and once one more time with feeling i highly highly recommend locating a copy of this and sitting down and watching it at least once in your life if you've never seen this film let's make sure we get out there folks get those hashtags trending on social media hashtag cost of d18 studios Hashtag Renegades Reviews, Hashtag Renegade Returns, and of course, the ever popular Hashtag Shenanigans. We interrupt this episode of Renegades Reviews for an important announcement about... Merchandising. Merchandising? What's that? Merchandising. Come, I'll show you. Merchandising, merchandising, where the real money's made. Make sure you go over to teespring.com slash stores slash Jeff Meacham Network for all the t-shirts you see here from the West Coast professor Jeff Meacham himself. You can get shirts for the Jeff Meacham Network, Talk Wrestling, as well as the red and gold Meachamania shirts. And while you're there, don't forget to get your shirts of the Casa D18 Studios Brotherhood, the Dads on Wrestling shirt, the Renegade J.J. Williams, Stat Boy Sports Bar, and the hashtag Statboy Approved shirt. Make sure you go over to teespring.com slash stores slash Jeff Meacham Network and score your shirts today. Don't forget to get out there. Do what the commercial just told you. Get the gear. Support the Casa D18 Studios Brotherhood. Get you your dad's not always on wrestling shirt. Renegade J.J. Williams, Statboy Sports Bar, Jeff Meacham Network, Talk Wrestling, Meachamania, etc etc all at teespring.com slash stores slash jeff meacham network get your gear and support the brotherhood today tomorrow we're going to be taking a look at another prominent historical figure in african-american culture as we continue our celebration of black history month and we're going to be taking a look at marshall the story of Thurgood Marshall, starring the late Chadwick Boseman in the title role, along with Josh Gad, Kate Hudson, Dan Stevens, Sterling K. Brown, and many, many others. Thank you for watching another brand new installment of Renegades Reviews right here on the Casa D18 Studios channel. I am the renegade J.J. Williams, and I will see you tomorrow right here when I talk about Marshall. And I will see you all then.